everybody, welcome back. I'm Tyler Edlin, illustrator, concept artist, and instructor. And this is part three of Do Your Shadows Suck? So if you missed one and two, I'm not going to go into depth recapping them here, but check the links below. And in this part, I'm going to cover three primary topics. The first being how to calculate shadows. What are their shapes? What are their directions? Followed by that, we'll be talking about edge control and grouping. And then I'll end with a little bit of a painting demo, kind of putting all that together in a great exercise that we can all practice. So if we're starting off with our light source here, a simple one, you know, it's the key light, the only light source in the scene. We have a very simple primitive shape, the square, the rectangle, the box, or the cube. Um, and we want to generate a shadow for this based off this light source. Well the first thing to kind of ask yourself is what side of this or what sides of this will be in shadow and I think it's safe to say that if the lights coming from this side that the, the backside and this backside that is totally unseen to us will be in shadow uh, but so okay that that's a simple enough premise but how do we kind of take this idea and calculate um, a quasi realistic uh, cast shadow from this well the first thing to do is to kind of draw a few plumb lines through the object uh, you know, three lines that would intersect the top three faces here, because this one's not going to be uh, connecting any sort of shadow at all. It's 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 irrelevant. That's why we're choosing these three points. And then again, from the bottom of the the light source, the three bottom points as well. And once we kind of have those lines figured out, we can begin to kind of see shapes, uh, and within the the diagram and where these lines are crossing. And we want to look at them and figure out which ones are kind of intersecting at the outer perimeter and then we we actually have them uh, so what we want to do is to take these three shapes so again coming off of the off the uh, the square itself and kind of connect the dots with them one two three I mean, you don't have to do it with this marquee tool but I, I just wanted to show you because it's a quick you know angular way to kind of select this idea and then you know like we we have that shape we can fill this with the the cache shadow itself so we can fill and there and so there we have it our light source our cube and our cast shadow from it maybe you know in this case you you can you can soften that a bit again you can even go through and blur or smudge in up you know, smudge up the edges it, the further they're away from the source the softer they're going to be now I wanted to show you this other scenario over here for instance what if our cast shadow hit or were interrupted by another object or form uh, and to illustrate that what I did here was take the line kind of drew through the same shape you know as I have here and then what we want to do is go up vertically where it would intersect the other object or wall and then kind of what we do is take the up oh, this should be here and take the, the you know the, the the edges where it's hitting the object so in right here to right here and then this is the shadow area that it would be in so taking you know the so taking the polygonal lasso tool I can take that box out where the shape and the projected shadow is going to be and the shadow side itself in this case make a selection from that and just tell it to fill like so I can turn down the opacity just so we can see the, the shape through it. Shut off the construction lines. And then this is how it would appear basically if we had a the light source here with the cast shadow and it began to hit the other object. So again, the higher the light, the kind of more inclination there would be on that shadow itself. So for instance, if this is the light that may be around three in the afternoon, maybe two or four, depending on the season. If we're talking about high noon, we have like those sharp, shallow shadows, and it would look more like this. So once you kind of know, you know, how or what the time of day may be, it's it's easier to approximate the side of, or you know, the the, the length of the shadow or how sh or how shallow it is. And now, how does this play into if we're or for sculpting shapes or configuring architecture with light? Well, it's like let's imagine there's a door here. Just a simple kind of door. What you know? What would the shadow kind of look like for that? Well, we'd have you know, just if it, depending on the depth, it would kind of look like that. And then depending again on the time the time of day, we would depend how long the shadow is underneath it. So again, this is like a great way just having this knowledge to plan out and drawing our shapes, you know, in our in our pattern language in a sense, 
for these various types of forms. So now we have kind of like a cornice up here with another layer of detail. So again, you can do this and, and project it for, for any sort of light situation. So like, what if we had the light coming over here on the right, right? We'd have, you know, this would be all, and this would all be in shadow. And then it's like the same thing. If we had, you know, the light source, you know, say from here, and then we'd have it, you kind of just configure it kind of going up, you know, from wherever that point is, like so. And then again, we'd have that kind of cast shadow from it, and it's illuminated this side. All right, everybody, in this next part, I'd like to highlight uh, just some differences and some ways we can utilize edge control and grouping. So as you can see, I do have a, uh, a value spectrum down here from light to shadow, and I want you to notice that I have the edges in the lighter side a lot more crisp, a lot more uh, differentiated than in the shadows where they're a lot softer, so they completely become lost. And this is how I approach any scale painting. I usually like to keep very crisp, very articulated details in the highlights, and as things get lost into the shadows, I take more artistic liberties. I embellish and push color, I imply a little bit more, my brushwork gets a little looser. And that's where kind of like the old saying, I'm and I'm not really sure where this comes from, but uh, it was once said, you know, drawing is for what's in the light and shadows is where the color is. And I'll explain, and I'll explain this a, a little bit better over the next few minutes now. So right, we have hard edges, lost edges. So here's a very simple setup right of these blocks and there's very clear shapes. If we were to literally go around and through them and to trace all the major areas of this, not counting that background. Now we have highlights, a couple shapes that are mid-tones, and of course the shapes that are shadows. And what I'm saying here is not anything new. Marco Bucci also says this really, really well in his uh, 10 Minutes to Better Painting, episode one. So definitely check that out if you haven't. But yeah, we're gonna, my goal with this and with most paintings is to simplify this shapes and to curate this information so that it's more digestible for a viewer. Because think about if you're gonna concept out like a spaceport or illustrate an army fighting another army, that's way too much information. So often what we want to do is group and to simplify that. So that would, you know, in this context, this is what it's going to sort of look like, right? The shadows start to blend together The while the highlights are still kind of maintaining their shapes. And it's just like a little bit of embellishment overall. So see, like it, it's just a subtle grouping overall of all that information. So see, it, it just kind of comes together. And I have to put the disclaimer, this is just purely artistic decisions. Your mileage may vary. You may want to make different decisions, but this is usually what I try to do and it's worked really, really well so far. So if we really kind of organize the shapes, you know, there's there's this one, two, and three major highlight shapes and the shadows we kind of grouped them down to three as well. So that's six from like 15 or 16, quite a huge difference. And it would make this uh, as a thumbnail basically read even better, the smaller it is. It's a simple enough scene as it is, so it, it really won't make too, too much of a difference. But just think of the complexity of how a scene can get and the benefits that will uh, come with it. All right, so many hard and lost edges. And of course, just the simple shapes. All right, so here's an assignment I I did ages ago in one of Sam Nielsen's uh, color and light classes. I believe he still runs the same course over at Schoolism currently. So I'm not the original creator of this, but you basically take a few basic primitive shapes, you assign a local color to them, white, red, and a green in this case, and then you add, do different lighting scenarios and things to them. Now this is typically what I see eight out of 10 times from a student example, where basically we're to shadow, we're adding black and that's shading and to add the highlights, we're just adding pure white, which is tinting. And while that can work, I would often argue there are better solutions. So what we really wanna do is to, to kind of bring in lots more color to the shadows. As I just said, uh, the shadows are where the color thrives. And what we're doing here is a direct light source on the upper left. And that's kind of like a very neutral, sort of warm light bulb, uh, a color. So if we have a white sphere, right, it's gonna get very light on top and it's gonna go into shadow as we go around that form. Now what I'm doing is I'm just selecting a lot of these shapes piece by piece, bit by bit, and I'm bringing in some of that immediate bounce light from the surrounding uh, shapes here. 
Now it's important to note, while uh, direct light is very important, the more saturated a local color is of a sphere, like the red and the green are each more saturated than this white sphere, which is basically a neutral, colors that are more saturated generally resist overexposure of that light. So that means when I'm adding this direct light source to this white sphere, it's, it's gonna be a little bit softer. It's just gonna go to light. You can't really see the effect. But like if I have a dull red, we're gonna start to basically make that brighter and more saturated. And it's gonna kind of flat line out once we hit a point in regards to that overall color exposure. Really to figure out or where, where you wanna show the purity of a midtone in regards to the objects, as you'll see me do across the three of these, are in the midtones. Midtones are where the basically the only place where you'll really see the most accurate version of a local color, because the the shadows these are filled with ambient lights, do bluish purples from the background, and of course the colors from the spheres themselves. So see this green lost a lot of its purity, a lot of its original color that we were gonna go with. And so this is a very saturated object. This is probably the, uh, just as saturated as that red sphere is supposed to be. Maybe it's even a little bit more so. And I'd have to say what this student did do right is get the overall exposure of these objects on a very consistent level because they are the same material. And that's where some people do slip up. They'll make some objects very overexposed, very saturated, and then some of them very dull very mundane. So we do want to keep that consistent. So I'm dropping in some of that key light, right, as we get that green, just kind of splashing out to a very warm sort of green. And now we're going to add in the uh, cast shadow from that white sphere. All right, so we have the cast shadow meeting the form shadow, which we covered way back in episode one. And it makes a nice little dynamic play. It really already starts to look three dimensional. So basically the, the highlight colors are fairly one dimensional. They're fairly simple. And I'm really trying to embellish as I zoom in here to kind of illustrate this, I'm trying to add blues from the, the bounce light on the floor up into these greens. And again, I'm overplaying this and it's, it's a bit of an artistic choice because it absolutely looks really nice and juicy. Like you can feel the light just bouncing around all these shadow areas in the ambient light here. And that's what I just personally love to get out of uh, a painting. So we bring a little bit of red and warm up the shadows on this side, kind of going into a little bit of a nice purple. And really, if we were actually to color pick that, it's going to make a neutral because red and green are complements. And when you start adding complementary colors together, you're going to get a very nice, very deep, rich neutral color in that shadow. And that's what I'm trying to push. And that's what a lot of students and beginners tend to neglect is they'll just make those shadows really, really dark and black which we can really, as we learned throughout the three episodes here, we can really push colors there and really bring out a sense of life out of that object. See, we can just stretch that. I'm not taking the time, disclaimer, to make these absolutely perfect. So let's say you think this assignment may be a little too basic. You can really ramp this up. There's a lot of varieties you can do. You can change the material. You could change the direction of the color. You can uh, push and pull certain elements of these to create new unique shapes you could drop some holes in it's a really modular sort of assignment now i do recommend if you are on the more beginner side do this in groups you take turns coming up with the shapes and the local colors pass them around everyone set a timer for an hour then compare notes it's a great way to grow together now what i'm trying to do here is get the exposure on that red uh correct now white really isn't going to bounce around you're not going to see that come into that red and that's what I'm trying to kind of correct out here. I, I kind of come back and get that on the uh, backswing. But yeah, getting a little bit of those shadows where that uh, white sphere and that red one are meeting, that ambient occlusion, that's what I'm kind of trying to get first. And then I'll get that mid-tone on that white sphere a little bit more properly like you can see here. But thank you guys for those that have stuck with me through these three videos. Hopefully you can do something very similar again in the future. This has been really fun for me because at least with my classes, I don't directly teach color and light, so I enjoyed all of this. But I do help lots of the individual students taking the mentorship with this subject. So I've had uh, lots of fun kind of even comparing and showing notes to them as well. But yeah, just putting a last few minute artistic touches on this, really adding a little bit of bloom effect, letting that warm light kind of just dissipate a little into the surrounding atmosphere. It's an aesthetic I just like to push for. 
And then the last uh, touch I have to do at this stage is just to come in and kind of correct those shadows out. They're a little bit dull. They're a little bit uh, not kind of there yet. But let me know if you have any questions in the comment. I know there were a few before that specifically asked about uh, skin tones and things like that. Well, that, that would be very situational, very circumstantial. So that would need like probably a separate video to kind of talk a little bit more about in its own. But uh, have a great uh, summer and I'll, again, I'll upload as soon as I, as I can. The schedule's been really tight lately. Take care.